Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're going to try and start on time, being a, a Swiss organization. Welcome to our second council briefing. For those of you that didn't join us for the first, just a very brief explanation. This is just a, an exercise in trying to bring some of, the, um, some of the more interesting thought leadership being generated in the councils at the summit this week and, and offering you the opportunity to ask questions, drill away at some of our experts. We're trying to take issues which we think are of uh, regional, local, and international importance, and also areas where the Council are particularly active. This one is on the future, of uh, the future of government, governments of the future. What can governments do to be more effective, to deliver better services, to build and rebuild and regain trust of the people they govern? Very pleased to be joined by two um, colleagues from the Council on the future of government. I'm going to ask each of them to talk for a couple of minutes and give their views on particular aspects of, of their work and, and their interests within the council. And then I encourage you to ask as many questions um, as you like. We do have 20 minutes, so without further ado, I'll introduce my first speaker, Mr. Rolf Alter, He's a Director, Public Governance and Territorial Development at the OECD, and of course a member of the Future uh, of Government Global Agenda Council. Rolf, perhaps you could just give us a, a very brief overview on what do you think governments are doing wrong and what they could do to uh, rebuild better trust. Well, Oliver, first uh, perhaps is to say that in fact uh, the situation in most countries uh, of the OECD and beyond uh, is pretty uh, bad when it comes to the confidence of citizens into government. And why is that an important feature? It is really relevant for two reasons. Of course, first of all, one could say, isn't really government uh, in the end about uh, creating a trusted uh, society and a good economy so that growth, prosperity, access to education, to health is guaranteed? If we agree on that, then we would say, well, there is a lot of uh, activity out there in terms of reforms. Uh, when you think about the OECD's uh, really plea for structural reforms to cope with the current uh, difficult situation, and the current difficult situation is there to last for a while, then it would be very useful to think about how to get out of this uh, very low or get up from this very low level of trust. And I think here, uh, thinking about what could governments do and where is part of the solution, cannot be done by themselves uh, alone, but where is a reasonable uh, uh, factor and where are measures that government can take. We had here a good discussion about the role of technology, and I'm sure you will hear uh, more about it. It is a vast potential, but not so easy to exploit uh, as it perhaps looks like. But there is, of course, also the issue of uh, can't we use, and when we think about where would we use uh, technology, comes to mind, first of all, do actually governments have enough evidence for their policy making? Do they have the right data? Do they use the right data? And do they take decisions that are justified in sort of an analytical approach? Second, simply straightforward, is transparency. To what extent is transparency today already uh, a feature or is it more of an aspiration? And by transparency, I'm not just meaning giving uh, the or making the accounts open. It's also about transparency in the sense of dealing with citizens, responding, being open, being ready to listen to and to act about this. Responsiveness, if you like, a very important feature. And the last point I want to make in this context is really the issue of innovation. We have uh, looked at this uh, for uh, uh, the last session here, the last two years, tried to put something together. I think there's a very nice report out there. Actually, we won a prize, and I want to say that was uh, something that uh, is something at least of uh, a recognition here from the World Economic Forum. I think uh, it says uh, there is a long way to go to make uh, governments more ready to innovate. They are ready to do it, but they don't quite know how to do it well and, so, of course, uh, in particular, in a sustainable way. I think I leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And there will be time for questions uh, afterwards, so get your questions ready. Just for a bit of context, yesterday during the opening plenary, if you missed it, one of the GAC Vision Awards was, um, was received by the uh, Council on Future of Government in recognition of the smart toolkit that they produced and was actually 
incubated here in the UAE, amongst other places, and there's also now um, being roadshowed around the world, and uh, I know a number of governments are interested in, in looking at what kind of best practices they can take. So um, we can find more information for you on that, if you like. Um, now, Yaza, you're um, on the me a member of the same council. You, uh, you're coming at the, the issue of future government from a different um, angle, service delivery. Perhaps maybe share us some of the best practices that you've seen any examples from around the world that could be deployed here, and maybe vice versa, what this region is doing well, what was, uh, and which could be deployed elsewhere? Thank you, Oliver. Yes, we, the, our council has tried to look at experiences from around the world, and our, initially what we were starting to look at is how can governments be more effective and efficient. And of course, the whole world now is being influenced by technology, the fast pace of technological development, technological tools available. So we started looking specifically at how technology is going to help governments improve their delivery of services and how it will shape the future of government. You've seen the rise of communication technology and social media and how that's affecting the governments as we know them, the way they communicate, the way they talk about the issues, the way they listen to issues from people. And we specifically looked at service delivery. How are governments using technology to improve service delivery? And by service delivery, we mean everything from education to health to infrastructure to even even helping with transparency issues and 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 communicating the messages um, in our attempts to do that as well not only did we look at the potential future of government how will the internet of things affect government we also documented case studies from around the world where things have been improved with good results to, that impacted the citizens and we have in our report about 30 case studies from around the world and i'll mention two things about the case studies one is that they are all fairly innovative and they have introduced new ways of doing things, which is expected. But the second, which wasn't very much expected, is a lot of innovations coming, a lot of technology is unleashing the potential to innovate in many, many governments. In the past, most of the leading government best practices used to come from the, the OECD countries maybe, or the Western countries, whereas now innovation with the availability of technology is allowing us to identify innovations in many different countries. We've, got, we've documented cases from Nigeria, from India, uh, what we would call reverse innovation. We have two cases documented from the UAE, where the UAE has also been quite a leader, uh, uh, regionally at least, if not globally, in applying the smart government applications and trying to improve various services. So I'll stop at that and uh, see if there are any questions you want to dig deeper into. Thanks, okay. A quick show of hands, see who wants to ask a question. Gentleman at the back row there, microphone on its way. Just remind us, please, uh, your name and where you're from. Yeah, uh, this question is for Mr. Jarrah. I'm Sadesh from Gulf News. Could you elaborate more on these two case studies on the UAE, how they've made the smart applications uh, work in public domain? Good, so we'll, I'll, I'll talk about, briefly, I mean, we all know the UAE has launched um, a couple of years ago, the whole smart government uh, strategy. Uh, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, the, uh, the vice uh, president and uh, prime minister of the UAE, also launched a challenge for all the government entities at the federal government, two years to put their services online and they make them available via the mobile. So the drive and the commitment has been there. What we try to capture is some areas where we have seen the results also, the results affected our lives. So one of the, one of the cases we wrote was the UAE border controls. I think the UAE now is almost leading the world in border control via the e-gates. And we, all of us who travel a lot know the e-gate in the UAE. We don't know that application. But behind the e-gate, there are so many other ways. You know, the UAE border control, how it's connected from all ports, entries in and out of the UAE. So that was a fantastic use of technology. A, to make the lives of travelers easier, but it had many implications. It improved security. It improved data management. It improved what we just generally call access in and out of the UAE. It's a very complex technological approach and application and has many, many wide implications. And that's one of the cases where we think, you know, visible impact has been made. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. A couple of quick ones here while we, uh, while we have these experts. Um, Yaza, tell me your single most impressive um, piece of best practice you've, you've seen in the past year. You're in this field. Um, immersed in this field on a daily basis. You mentioned a couple of examples of places around the world where you've seen um, leapfrogging going on, but w what has really stood out for you as a, an amazing example of um, future government best practice? 
Well, look, I mentioned the UAE example, which is one of the uh, earlier uses of this. But for example, one of the examples I'm very fond of is where we started finding not only the use of technology, but also the, the combination of public and private sector working together to solve some of the issues. Like if we look at places like Nigeria, where they had issues with payments, payment, uh, facilitating payments, anything from salaries to getting social, uh, social benefits out, they, been, they collaborated very closely with MasterCard. So if you go to those places, you will find that the national ID, which is, you know, everybody has a national ID, is also itself a payment uh, card. So they use the power of the plastic national ID to make it a payment card. So suddenly you've connected so many people to an e-payment gateway. And that to me is a fantastic ex example of a few things. First of all, collaboration between public and private sector. It's an out-of-the-box use of technology. And it also allowed access to so many people who wouldn't have general access to payments or money flows or banks. And that impacted a lot of people. It's also an example from Nigeria, where the need was very high. It's what we call reverse innovation. And it solved a lot of issues. And this is a leapfrog. This is something that, you know, somebody who had a lot of issues suddenly produced something that some, all the other countries are still going to start to look at. We saw examples from India. Uh, that doesn't mean that's the only sources of innovation. The OECD countries, the West has a lot of them, but these are the ones I'm excited the most about. Rolf, you're um, coming up to halfway through the, the summit this year. What are the, um, can you give us some insights into where you think the future of government will be the council will be focusing on for the current two-year term? Well, you know, it's all about actually how can we ensure that governments can implement innovation. I think that's where we will really focus on. And of course, once again, uh, technology plays an important role. To understand the potential to apply it, but make sure that uh, government uh, really takes it on uh, in a sustainable way. I think there is, uh, there is good input here to be produced. I just want to say, uh, sometimes we had here the, uh, sort of we're trying to find out why, what is it? that government isn't really reacting sort of full speed to what uh, technology offers. And that has something to do with the way how government work. It has to be do with capacities in government. Frankly, that's also an issue. Are people really up to taking on all these fantastic technologies? But there is also a question of balancing maybe other objectives than just efficiency. And I'll give you an example. We assume in many places that the internet is a fantastic way to communicate. But is it? That's still a question. Is it in the sense of a large part of the population is not connected or cannot use it? And typically people who would probably most in need such as the guys that are ill or old. How do you deliver to those people through these internet-based options? It's a real challenge for countries to deal with these issues. And I take another example. Data, yes, uh, my friend Yasser was talking about the fantastic opportunities to using data, but in some parts of the world, people are very, very concerned with their privacy. How does that work? And what is there? How do we deal with this trade-off? So it's not just about the potential of uh, technology. It's also about it comes at what price? And what do we have to give for that? Therefore, I think the future of government, when you talk about this here in the World Economic Forum, and I uh, think it is always a fantastic place to really hear most different views in these fantastic uh, council groups. But the main issue is, think we need to do a little bit more work on how do we balance that and what is it that in the end governments really are expected to deliver. Efficiency is one goal, but it cannot be the only one. Thank you very much. Well, we all have very hectic, tight schedules today, and not least our panelists here. So I'd like to close this council briefing. Thanks very much to my panelists for joining us, and thanks to yourselves. We'll be back here in 15 minutes for the launch of the Global Leadership Index. So you may feel that you want to keep your seat warm and, and, and stay put. I know for a fact Yaza will be back on the panel as well. But in the meantime, thanks very much for joining us and see you back here in 15. Thank you.